So sometimes you gotta wonder, who's watching the watchers? Hello everyone, Dylan Schumacher, Citadel Defense. Recently, the FBI was called to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, and there was a hearing, a hearing before the Senate, and uh, Ted Cruz had some questions, and so this happened. I want to turn to the FBI. How many FBI agents or confidential informants actively participated in the events of January 6th? Sir, I'm sure you can appreciate that I can't go into the specifics of sources and methods. Uh, Did any the, FBI agents any FBI or agents confidential or informants confidential actively informants participate, participate in the events of January 6th? Events yes, January or no? 6th. yes or no? Sir, I can't, I can't answer that. Did any FBI agents or confidential informants commit crimes of violence on January 6th? I can't answer that, sir. Did any FBI agents or FBI informants actively encourage and incite crimes of violence on January 6th? Sir, I can't answer that. Ms. Sadburn, who is Ray Epps? I'm aware of the individual, sir. Uh, I don't have the specific background to him. Well, there are a lot of well, people who are understandably very, very concerned about Mr. Epps. On the night of January 5th, 2021, Epps wandered around the crowd that had gathered. And there's video out there of him chanting, tomorrow, we need to get into the Capitol, into the Capitol. This was strange behavior, so strange that the crowd began chanting, fed, 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 fed. Ms. Sandburn, was Ray Epps a fed? Sir, I cannot answer that question. The next day, the next day, on January 6th, Mr. Epps is seen whispering to a person, and five seconds later, five seconds after he's whispering to a person, that same person begins to forcibly tear down the barricades. Did Mr. Epps urge them to tear down the barricades? Sir, similar to the other answers, I cannot answer that. Shortly thereafter, the FBI put out a public post listing, seeking information on individuals connected with violent crimes on January 6th. Among those individuals in the bottom there is Mr. Epps. The FBI publicly asked for information, identifying, offering cash rewards leading to information, leading to, for information leading to the arrest. This was posted and then sometime later, Magically, Mr. Epps disappeared from the public posting. According to public records, Mr. Epps has not been charged with anything. No one's explained why a person videoed urging people to go to the Capitol, a person whose conduct was so suspect the crowd believed he was a Fed, would magically disappear from the list of people the FBI was looking at. Ms. Sandburn, a lot of Americans are concerned that the federal government deliberately encouraged illegal and violent conduct on January 6th. My question to you, and this is, a, this is not an ordinary law enforcement question, this is a question of a public accountability. Did federal agents or those in service of federal agent actively encourage violent and criminal conduct on January 6th? Not to my knowledge, sir. Now, the first thing I asked when I watched that was if the FBI does not have to answer questions before Congress, before the Senate, then who does the FBI have to answer questions to? Like, like where's the accountability here? If the FBI can go before Congress and just say, uh, we, can't, we can't answer that, you know, secrecy and police stuff and we're just doing our jobs. Like, if they can say that and they don't have to answer questions, well, then when do they have to answer questions? Because the Congress is, is the most powerful branch of government, okay? The branches of government are not equal in power. Uh, Congress, by far, constitutionally laid out, is the most powerful branch of government. It has, it has the most powers um, given to it in the Constitution. So if you can ignore Congress, then again, I ask, 
Who do they have to answer questions for? Is the FBI actually accountable to anyone? So I asked that question, and I did a little bit of research, and we're going to go over to the whiteboard. Okay, so, like all good stories, let's start at the beginning. First, you have the president. The president presides over a bunch of different people that he shouldn't, but that's a different discussion. The president does preside over a position called the Attorney General. The Attorney General was created by Congress in 1789. This was done under the Judiciary Act in 1789, and the original job of the Attorney General was a part-time part position for one person, and the original job was basically to be the head lawyer for the government, right? Like, if there's a case that goes before the Supreme Court and you need, the, you need a lawyer to argue the government's side, that would be the Attorney General. Uh, or, you know, if the President needs advice on legal matters or the Constitution, or Congress needs advice on legal matters or the Constitution, you'd go to the Attorney General. He's, he's basically the head lawyer for the government. Right? And honestly, I can understand why the government would need that within our current role. Right? I mean, it's 1789, like the country's brand new. So you, you got to have a head lawyer for the government so that you can argue cases again in the Supreme Court. Understandable. Skip ahead to 1870. And in 1870, Congress again creates, and this is an important theme, watch out what Congress does and does not create in this story. In 1870, Congress creates the Department of Justice. It's 1870, so we're about five years after the Civil War, and the original purpose, so you're gonna like this, the original purpose for the founding of the Department of Justice is to protect civil rights. That was why the Department of Justice was founded in 1870, because in 1870, like I said, the Civil War is over, uh, we have added some amendments to the Constitution, like black people can vote, for instance, uh, among other things. And you know the Ku Klux Klan is running rampant in the South and, and there's some issues there. And so the Department of Justice is created in order to protect people's civil rights and, and stop you know, what essentially more or less is kind of domestic terrorism at that time. So that's why the Department of Justice was created, was to protect people's civil rights because those rights were being terrorized by other people. Now, in 1887, you have the Interstate Commerce Act. Just a side note here, basically this act starts to give the federal government some federal policing powers. You gotta remember, for most of American history, the federal government did not have policing powers. If you look in the Constitution, you will find zero federal policing powers. That was a power that resided with the states and more specifically, the counties, right? Counties elected sheriffs and sheriffs kind of you know, kept the law of the land. But I just wanna note that in our little story here because it's gonna be important later. In 1896, you have the National Bureau of Criminal Identification created. What I will just call the National B Crim ID, okay? So that's created in 1896. And their job is to provide information on known criminals, right? They're, they're collecting a database of information on known criminals to provide to different agencies and police forces. In 1901, uh, President McKinley is assassinated and uh, President Roosevelt ends up, the FD, uh, Teddy, not FDR, ends up becoming president. So in 1908, you have the Bureau of Investigation created by the Attorney General. Now this is an important delineation because here you have a government agency that is created by an Attorney General. Now this is important because Congress was the one who created the Attorney General. Congress created the Department of Justice. Congress passed the Interstate Commerce Act. Congress created the National Criminal ID Program. Uh, at least I'm pretty sure about that last one. That, that might be a little bit false, but I, I think you still get the idea. Congress is the one creating these positions. But all of a sudden, in 1908, you have the Bureau of Investigation, and that is created by the Attorney General. Do you see how government has created government that now just creates more government? And there's a slip. There's a slip in authority there, and that's going to be a problem. Now, the President also is in charge of the Department of the Treasury, also created by Congress. A part of the Department of the Treasury is the IRS, which was created by Congress. In 1919, the United States passed Prohibition, where we made the creation and sale of, the creation and sale of alcohol illegal. 
So, as a result of that, in 1920, the Bureau of Prohibition was created, and that resided under the IRS. The Bureau of Prohibition is exactly what you think it is. Uh, they were a police, federal police force that uh, enforced prohibition, right? You've maybe seen the movie Untouchables uh, with Kevin Costner, a pretty old movie, uh, and I believe Robert De Niro was Al Capone. And so, in that movie, The Untouchables, they are technically the Bureau of Prohibition. That, that's who they are in that movie. Uh, I think in the movie they call them the FBI, but we're technically the Bureau of Prohibition. So, in 1930, the Bureau of Prohibition moves from being under the Department of Treasury and the IRS to being under the Department of Justice. In 1933, FDR signs an executive order which massively expands the powers of the Department of Justice. Again, remember, this is not done by Congress. This is FDR just making stuff up because why not? So one of the things that he does in there is he combines the Bureau of Investigation and the Bureau of Prohibition into, uh, I believe they called it the, the Department of Investigation or DOI or something like that, but whatever. Later that same year, they rename it the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So you look at this, and I want you to tell me, who exactly is the FBI accountable to? Is it clear? I mean, can you figure it out? So my point here is that government has created government, which has created government, which the FBI is layered so intensely deep and ultimately the creation of an executive order and not an act of Congress. So if you look at that and you're just as confused as I am, you can see here that there's no real accountability or oversight of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And that's a problem. It's been a problem since its inception. If you're ever wondering, oh, the FBI isn't that bad, they keep us safe, don't they? Take a look through their Wikipedia page sometime and you will note the myriad of issues where the FBI did not protect people, but rather created issues, trampled all over rights, and was not a helpful organization and has not been since its inception. The way this, of course, should work is that the FBI should be beholden unto the Attorney General, who should then be beholden unto Congress, because Congress, again, created all of these positions. But in practicality, of course, that doesn't work. Instead, because the FBI is buried so many levels deep in the bureaucracy, they're able to hide and do whatever they want. <clears throat> now, in case you're wondering if this is really a problem, the FBI has over 35,000 employees and an annual budget of over $9.7 trillion. $9.7 trillion and 35,000 employees. Think about the damage and destruction an institution like that could do in your government with no accountability. Do brave deeds and endure.